much has been written and speculated about what that one under, unforgivable sin is, the blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. Some have spoken of it as apostasy, although we know it's still possible to reconcile to God. People have deathbed conversions. Others have said it could be something against human life. It's really not clear, although the one area I kind of fall into, at least the school of thought, is the whole idea of one who just obstinately refuses to recognize God's forgiveness, to recognize God's mercy. That kind of puts us in the category of being unforgiven because we don't seek it. We don't recognize it. It's almost like we don't want it. We refuse God's grace and God's mercy. You know, I believe it's possible that we could fall into that category, although we could never, ever find ourselves in a position of judging someone. We don't know the human heart, even in those last moments of death. We don't know how God can work, how God could bring about even last-minute conversions. As Pope Francis has said, while we may tire of seeking God's mercy, God never tires in extending it. And I believe that's a, not a bad framework for this day as we pray for unborn human life. You know, there are times in us that we might want to, you know, stir up within us this sense of a righteous anger or indignation. And yet, in many ways, when we find ourselves kind of taking on even a speck of what could be seen as evil to fight evil, we find ourselves really in that gospel today. How can a house divided ever stand? If Satan is divided against himself, he falls. If the church is divided against herself, she falls. Rather, how does one overcome evil? How does one overcome an evil even as such as one that disrespects the basic premise of the dignity of all human life? And the answer really subsists in one word. It's in love. You know, while one can be repulsed, one can have that indignation at the taking of a human life in any way, shape, or form, how do we respond to that? Not with violence, not with anger, not with judgment even. It really comes down to radical accompaniment, radical hospitality. One of the great signs I saw, you know, um, I wasn't there personally, but from the march on Washington this past week was the sign that said, love them both. Love the unborn child. Love the mother in whom that unborn child lives and grows. One of the things that I believe we fall prey to in our culture, on both sides, is really looking for the quick fix, the easy argument. Abortion often is seen as the quick fix to an unplanned pregnancy, an unplanned pregnancy that seems to be disruptive of one's plans of one's hopes, one's dreams. It wasn't something seen. It's not the right time. It's not the perfect scenario. Well, most of us, I think, when we were born into this world, were born into less than perfect scenarios. At least my mother reminded me so in many times. At the same time, if we can see that God is the source of all surprises, and in those surprises also the source and the avenue of all grace, we can see how God can work in circumstances. Now, on the other side, we need to be careful that we just don't say, we just need to be pro-birth and not just pro-life. Pro-life means that we have a responsibility as a community, as a culture, as a society, not just seeing that children are born, but that human lives are nurtured. You know, there are other issues as well that kind of accompany that as well. We need to bring the child in to, to see the light of day, to be sure, but also work to make sure that that child is valued, that that child is loved, that that child is educated, has health care, is nurtured. You know, far too many children 
live in poverty in our country, and we're supposed to be the wealthiest or one of the wealthiest countries in the world. And yet, we still see the ugly face of poverty even within the bounds of our city right down the street. So my friends, today as we pray, we need to love them both. Love that child to birth. Love that mother and support her in bringing that child to birth, but also in growing that child, in raising that child, in forming that child. The old African proverb, it takes a village. Well, it does take a culture to raise any child. None of us should be left on our own. None of us should be left in isolation. Now, our culture does have a way to go. There's a lot of truth in that. But in working to transform our culture and our society to be one that really does expect to respect the dignity of all human life, we need to model it as a church with that radical hospitality, that radical accompaniment that says that we are there. It happens when we support our pregnancy centers. It helps when we, it, it's a big support when we help those who are victims of abortion. Project Rachel, Rachel's Vineyard, those who mourn the loss of their children lost through abortion when they thought that they had no other way. Judgment, wrath, and anger don't get us there. Compassion, love, mercy, those are the stepping stones on which we walk to bring about a culture of radical respect for human life. It starts in seeing the imprint of God in the person next to us so that we can see the imprint of God in the design of that little one in his or her mother's womb. So today we know that a house divided cannot stand. What is it that binds us together? Our conviction, our conviction to love as Jesus calls us to love, to respect human dignity as Jesus did, even to the point of himself yielding his own life on the cross, of allowing ourselves to be vessels of God's grace, of God's mercy, and of his hope in our world, even in the face of those who feel that they have no hope, that they have no other choices, that they find themselves painted in a corner, we as a church, as a community, as a body of Christians are called to nothing less to walk to those places, to extend our hand, and to accompany people on their journey wherever that has taken them, and to know that each life has potential, each life has value, each life has purpose. Amen? Amen. Let's stand now and turn to the